internet. I've looked everywhere and I can't find it. Well, then you open Strong's McClintock because Strong's McClintock is a 20, I think it's 12 volume. Actually, it's 12 volumes. But if you'll notice the print and the, the size of the print in these volumes, can you see that from here? No, you can't because you don't have good eyes like I do. I'm just kidding. Yeah, these are double column. Do you see how small that is? And these are like, I don't know, 800 pages. Are you guys hot? Oh. Uh, no, this is like 1,200 pages. So these are like 1,200 pages, 12 volumes, and the print's really small, double columned, and they researched everything theologically, biblical, theological, and ecclesiastical literature. So historical records, whatever you would want to find in there, if you can't find it anywhere else, you'll probably find it in there. But he has a section on Simon the Sorcerer, which we'll, we'll kind of go over. But there's some other ones that I found with Gil and some of the other men that talk about him. And I think it's important to understand this because we kind of breeze through this really quickly. Say, okay, so there's this guy named Simon, and he, did, and he was a sorcerer, and he bewitched people. He did some things, and then Peter had a discussion with him, and then it was over. Well, that's where the biblical account is ends for us is but there's a lot to that right there and also that historical which we know is not biblical it's historical but there's a lot of record of who this man was and what he had done you know what he was involved with and how he how he um, dealt with things so it's important to kind of get a get a good grasp of that we're going to start with verse number seven and we're going to read just verse seven through nine is all we're going to get through really um now, we will go back to verse 6 and deal with the entire context. Actually, we'll start with verse 6, and we'll go 6 through 9 and deal with the context of what was going on here. But we'll deal with the doctrinal portions next week probably, and there may be some other ones. I want to talk about the charismatic movement and Simon the Sorcerer because there's some links there. There's some things there. There's some really good points there to be brought out about, about Simon the Sorcerer, really good points to be brought out about him there with the, the which I would consider him kind of a charismatic figure a char in the charismatic movement he would be like one of those men in the churches he would be just like them so I'll explain that next week more but this week we'll talk about sorcery the sorcery that he used the power that he used and kind of who he was and get a good understanding of that. And I think that's it. That'll, that'll help us in this study to kind of grasp what's going on here. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. For there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he, that, it, that himself was some great one. Now think about those words. To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because out of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. So we're going to stop there. Let's pray. Father, Lord, please help us as we look at this portion of Scripture and help us to understand the, the context that's there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a man, Simon the Sorcerer. He's a man that is infamous. He's a man that was a deceiver. And the thing is that he set out to deceive. It wasn't that he was deceived himself in the sense of, you know, um, I'll explain to you his situation. Because if you're not careful, you won't understand his situation. You won't understand what happened there. Um, the lesson has been given us very early in the church's history for our admonition. And for us to watch and to be vigilant and to be diligent and to be sober-minded when it comes to, to things like this. We still have these men that will come into our churches today. Men and women that are represented in the New Testament as Simon the Sorcerers. Now listen, I don't mean they're mere lost men or lost women that have made a profession of faith before, but were never born again, they fall under conviction, and they're born again. I'm not talking about that. Okay, that's, that's not what happened here. That's not who this man was. This man came purposely to make a false profession. He purposely set out to do what he did. And he purposely did it by the power of sorcery. So he was an infiltrator to the Lord's churches. That's what Simon was. Simon was not a confused man. 
Simon was not a man that, that struggled with eternal security. <laughs> Simon was not a man that struggled with doubts and fears about his salvation. Do you understand that? Simon was a devil. That's what he was. He was in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. He was doing what he was doing on purpose. And there's a reason once you understand the figure and you understand what's being said here, then you can, you can understand who he is. Not every person that is a false convert and then gets born again, there, there's not something wrong with them, okay? There's not something, we don't need to keep an eye on that. Now, we always keep an eye on everyone uh, in that sense. And that's why church leaders are responsible to keep their eyes open and to, and to be diligent and to look and to talk. But at the same time, we're not to live in paranoia. We're not to live in, in fear. We're not to live that way, our lives in that way, and thinking that, you know, somebody's out to get us all the time. Uh, w God doesn't want us to live like that. God wants us to trust him, and he wants us to love people and, and not think evil of one another. But this, this was pretty evident what was going on here, and I'll explain that as we go. Um, I can tell you, though, that, um, that's, that this same thing has happened in this, in this ministry. My entire ministry, I've seen men changed by the Spirit of God. I'm not talking about Simon the Sorcerer. I'm talking about men that really were born again. They came here. They never knew they were lost. They never knew they were dead in trespasses and sins, and they were born again by the Spirit of God. Anytime someone gets under real Bible preaching, you're going to find conversions. You're going to find the gospel. You're going to find people being saved. You're going to find those that thought they were saved but never saw themselves as lost, never confessed their lost condition before, never knew they were guilty before God, never understood the gospel, in that sense, and they never had a personal one-on-one -on -one with the Lord where he showed them, you don't have any power over sin, you're dead still. And so that's what happened to me when I was 25. Uh, the Lord showed me, you know, you made a profession when you were like four, but you never had any power. I mean, you, you lived any, you never had any power over sin. I mean, you, when you got a chance to do evil, you did. When nobody was looking. That's how, you, that's, that, that actual, that actual sin, after I had come back to church or whatever, when I was a young man, that showed me that I wasn't saved. It took a few months for it to click with me. But after that old preacher preached, it showed me that, well, I wasn't saved. Well, how did I know that? Well, because, I mean, I maliciously hid my sin and did, yeah, my heart wasn't changed. I had an outward appearance, but my heart wasn't changed. My heart wasn't supernaturally changed by the Spirit of God. I knew there was something wrong when that old preacher preached. I was like, you know, I mean, I, I knew that, it, that there wasn't that change that was there at that time, that it wasn't there. I didn't know what, I didn't have that. There was something wrong. I looked back at my testimony, and it wasn't very clear. But that's not what we're talking, but then it became clear after I was born again by the Spirit of God. And then I had power over sin. I'm not saying I was perfect. I still have to repent every day. The point is that I don't maliciously live my life like that. I don't purposely go out and sin and hide it. I don't live my life on that, in that way any longer. I'm not saying that we don't fall into things and we don't make mistakes and we don't sin against God and we don't fail. Of course we do. I'm talking about maliciously. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you understand, if you understand, about, you understand the difference, right? It reminds me of the situation a long time ago with the truck and everything. You know what I mean? It's the same thing. The same thing that happened to me. That's what happened to me 17 years before, 16 years before. At that time, you were saved. But 16 years before, you know what I mean? That's the same thing. Except I hid my sin, and I was like, you know what? That It's because I wasn't saved. And a, f a few months later, that old preacher preached, and it made sense to me. Yeah, something's wrong. I knew that. I knew that. But ever since then, God has made me sensitive to sin and, and to hate it. And now you, <laughs> a person can have doubts and fears about things that aren't even, <laughs> they're not hiding anything. They're not living in anything. They're not doing anything. That's how you know the difference in those things. One is a paranoia of the mind. One is a trauma of the mind. One is anxiety, depression, and a whole sort of other things. But anyway, um, I don't want to get too far into that because that's not my point. My point is, is that, that's not, I'm not talking about people like that. I'm not talking about people that are converted um, and under biblical preaching. I'm talking about a man that came in with an agenda. This man had it, right? These are nefarious false converts. These are sorcerers. These are Satan's workers. That's what they are. And we are warned by Paul about these men. This goes beyond normal depravity of a lost man. It's a supernatural depravity fueled by the spirit of Satan. He had a goal in mind. All right? I want to read you first from Strong's McClintock here. 
and, and kind of um, read you from page 755 of his, and he starts to explain him, and I'm going to explain him a little bit further. Uh, but, man, it's a big book. Look, they even got the screech owl in there. Nice. All right. That's what I'm saying. All right. I got it underlined somewhere here. Let's see. Here we go. I could borrow Lee's glasses, but I don't need them quite yet, but someday I will. Lee says I'm going to need those cheaters someday. I believe him. Okay. They say this, a Samaritan living in the apostolic age, distinguished by a source as a sorcerer or magician from his pra practice of magical arts, A.D. 30, and hence usually designed, designated in latter history as Simon Magus. That name Magus means magician. He was a magician. His history is a remarkable one. He was born at, at Giddon, a, a village of Samaria, Justin Martin says, identified with the modern uh, Kira Jit. Uh, he's talking about where he lived. Some doubt has been thrown on Justin's statement from the fact that Josephus mentions a reputed magician of the same name and about the same date who was born in Cyprus. Really doesn't matter. Now, some people say there were two excursions that, that Simon Magus made, and he actually met Peter again. But the scripture doesn't record that, so we can't say that's accurate. It has been suggested that Justin borrowed his information from the source and mistook uh, the town of Cyprus for Giddon. If the writers had respectfully used the Gentile forms and the similarity would have favored such a one, but neither does Josephus mention that city. It is far more probable that Josephus would be wrong than Justin in that point. Simon Magus was probably educated at Alexandria. Oh. Lots of crazy witchy poo stuff happened in Alexandria, <laughs> right? Yeah, as stated. And there became acquainted with the eclectic tenets of the Gnostic school. Makes sense, doesn't it? Who else fought the Gnostics? John. See, Peter, uh, Paul was warning us of them. John dealt with them. And wait till you hear what, what Simon Magus is accused of. And, I mean, it's in the scriptures too, but you have to be able to read what's being said. And understand the words that are being said there, which I'll show you a little bit of that. Either then and subsequently he was a pupil of Dositheus, who preceded him as a teacher of Gnosticism in Samaria, of whom he is supplemented, supplanted with the aid of Cleobus. He is first introduced to us in the Bible as practicing magical arts in the city of Samaria, perhaps Sychar. And was such that he was pronounced to be the power of God, which is called great, the great power of God. That's what they called him. They called him the great power of God. Now, pay attention closely. You're going to figure out what kind of figure he really is. But this is to lose the whole point of the designation. Okay, so he explains it. They intended to distinguish Simon from such an order of beings by adding the words which is called great, meaning thereby the source of all power. In other words, the supreme deity. When he called himself the great one, he was calling himself God in the flesh. You understand? That's what he meant. That's what he had deceived the people. So, okay, let me try to set this up for you, and I'll probably say it again, but that's okay. It'll sink in. So Simon the sorcerer comes along. In the city of Samaria, he had already built up a huge following before he ever made any profession, and he had said that he, had, he was the great one, and he had power, and he was a magician, and he was a sorcerer, and he understood all the dark arts, okay? He understood all those things. And he practiced witchcraft in that town. And he said he was God. All right? In the flesh. Are you following me? And then after he says he's God in the flesh, then Philip comes along to Samaria. And the whole town is in an uproar and a revival because Philip preaches unto them Jesus. And guess what happens when Jesus is preached where witches are? It's going to be some problems. But then when those witches figure out, wait a minute, my mojo doesn't work against him. So then Satan tries a different tactic. And what tactic would that be? Yep. 
He infiltrated them. That's what he did. He planned on it. And you could see by his motives, by what his motive was. So Philip has the power of God. Simon sees it and is like, whoa, I need that magic. I don't have that. I need that. How do I get that magic? I got to get closer. And he already had a huge following. Do you understand? He announced himself. Simon was recognized as the incarnation of this power. He announced himself as a special sense, some great one. Or to use his own words as reported by Jerome, um, a parkalet. Paraclete, yeah. Yeah, like the Holy Spirit. He pronounced himself deity. The preaching and miracles of Philip, having excited Simon's observation, he, came one of, he became one of his disciples and received baptism at his hands. Subsequently, he witnessed the effect produced by the imposition of hands as practiced by the Apostle Peter and John. And being desirous of acquiring a similar power for himself, he offered a sum of money for it. His object evidently was to apply the power to the prosecution of magical arts. The motive and the means were equally to be reprobated, and his proposition met with a severe denunciation from Peter, followed by a petition on the part of Simon, the tenor, of, of which bespeaks terror, but not penitence. There was no repentance. It's like Judas. There was no repentance, no biblical repentance. He was caught. The memory of his peculiar guilt has been perpetuated with the word simony. You ever heard of that? In Roman Catholicism, it's called when you sell uh, the religious, um, the gifts or the things of the church, and it's called simony. It was, it was labeled that. As applied to all traffic and spiritual offices. Simon's history subsequently to his meeting with Peter is involved in difficulties. Early church historians depict him as the pernicious foe of the apostle Peter. I find this very interesting for one reason. Have you noticed something about Simon the Sorcerer? What is his first name? Same name as Peter. You have Simon Peter, and you have Simon the Sorcerer. So it was almost as if Simon the Sorcerer was his nemesis. Do you see? There's a lot going on in this chapter that people don't understand that there, it's bigger than what you th This guy just didn't try to do what he did, and then it was just over. It wasn't a big deal. It, it became a very big deal. Peter's involved in difficulties. Early church historians depict him as that whose movement he followed for the purpose of seeking encounters in which he was signally defeated. In his journey, he was accompanied by a female named, now listen to this, Helena, who had previously been a prostitute at Tyre. Now listen to this. But who was now elevated to the position of divine intelligence. Of the divine intel or divine intelligence. Do you understand what was going on here? Yeah. Right. Yes. Now, now I want you to think of Kim Kardashian. And I want you to think of, I want you to think of Kanye West. As embodied in Helena's persona, we recognize the dualistic element of Gnosticism derived from the Manichaean system. What is it? The sons of God, daughters of men. It's magic. And I'm telling you, everything that Kanye West is doing is a great, big magic act. And he's doing it in the temple of God, saying he is God. He's doing it right there. That's how they do it. The Gnostics appear to have recognized uh, as the two original principles from whose junction all beings emanated. Simon and Helena were the incarnations in which these principles resided. Simon's first encounter with Peter took place at Caesarea Stratonus, according to the Constantinople, uh, whence, whence he followed the apostle to Rome. Eusebius makes no mention of the first encounter, but re represents 
Simon's journey to Rome is the following immediately after the interview recorded in Scripture. So he says that history records that the Scripture doesn't, but he's saying history records that he followed Peter. He, like, tried to shadow Peter. Was it true? I have no idea. But his chronological statements are evidently confused, for in the very same chapter he states that the meeting between the two at Rome took place in the reign of Claudius some ten years after the events in Samaria. Anyway, Justin Martyr, with great consistency, represents Simon as having visited Rome in the reign of Claudius and omits all notes of an encounter with Peter. His success there was so gr great that he was deified. And a statue was erected in his honor with the inscription, Simone Dio Sancto. Justin's authority has been impugned in respect to this statement on the ground that a tablet was discovered in 1574. Anyway, so there's some there's some there's a little bit of discrepancy in there whether that took place or not, but a lot of people believe that he was deified. Yes, and because he, he made himself out to be some great one. That's what he did. Anyway, so he goes on to talk about the above statements can be reconciled only by assuming that Simon made two expeditions to Rome, the first in the reign of Claudius, the second in which he encountered Peter in the reign of Nero about the year 68. And even this takes for granted the disputed of Peter's visit to Rome. So anyway, um, so there's a, there's a lot of speculation as to as to um, what he did afterwards. But when I read you some of these other accounts, there's, there was an attempt. Basically, what did Simon do? It probably refers to his attempt to combine Christianity with Gnosticism. Because that's what John was warring, warring, ab warning about and warring against was Gnosticism. You find that when he talks about when they deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Right? So, in other words, basically, they were denying the deity of Christ. That's what they were doing. And that's what the Gnostics did. And Simon became, according to this, Simon became the leader of that, of that Gnostic movement. And it makes sense. I want you to notice the similarity, though, that the churches will always have with this account of the sorcerer. Because there, there are very a lot of them. This is where we have to remember that the strength of any error is that it's mixed with truth. See, Simon didn't out and out reject everything. No, he came under the guise of it. What did Peter, Paul warn about? He said, there shall enter in what? Grievous wolves, not sparing the flock. Now, that was already happening at that time. Now, there was a notable revival going on where people were being gloriously saved by the grace of God. Lives are being changed supernaturally by the Spirit of God. Devils are being cast out of people. So then Satan took great notice of this when his kingdom was being assaulted. He took great notice of it because for a long time he bewitched the people. What does it say here? And to him they had regard because out of a long time he bewitched them with, his, with sorceries. So a long time Simon was a sorcerer. For a long time he bewitched those people. Then Philip came. And Satan didn't like it. See, Satan will not let any revival go without being assaulted. For a long time he had this stronghold. You know, it's, in, it's interesting, even in our church, that, that for, in this city, for a long time, Satan had this city with not much opposition, not much preaching against sin, not much lifting up the, the, the voice like a trumpet, not much handing out gospel tracts, not much of any of those things. And then when you, when you come here, when we came here uh, 13 years ago, when we came to this place, what happened? Well... A lot of enemies came from, with, from without to fight against, and then they came from within. That's how Satan works. He has to. He has to work that way. Then God raises up men to start a church and to preach the gospel, and it's a wonder that with the true converts there should be the witches. Isn't it a wonder? But they're there. That there should be those Simon Magus, Magises. I've met them. I've walked up and down the roads with them in service to the King of Kings. I've preached alongside of them. I've spent years with them. And how that fake looks so perfect, even more perfect than the real. See, real saints are challenged. Real saints are feeble. Real, real saints have weaknesses. Real saints are not perfect. Real saints, they have wars, they have battles, they have things that they have to fight. They don't come across as polished and perfect with no mistakes. When someone does, there's a problem. Amen. 
These have no outward feebleness in them, these that are supernaturally empowered to do what they do. They're powered by devils. And they know what they're doing. Eventually they're caught. And I don't mean saved. I mean caught and exposed. And then they can do nothing and they're rooted out. They have a power to do what they do. It's the power of witchcraft. You see, when Satan attacks you directly, when, when Satan attacks you directly, when he does it, he'll leave you in astonishment. You'll not realize it until it's over. But if you ever have an encounter with Satan directly through his sorcerers, you'll not soon forget it. It'll change the way you see things and bring sobriety and maturity to you, which you have not known before. Now, I do believe that all God's true generals, his preachers, his pastors, his men that he puts in place, I believe that they all must encounter Satan directly. I'm not speaking of visibly. It doesn't have to be. But through his ambassadors, through his counterfeit Christians. You see, I can tell you honestly that I know that I've had that encounter. I, I know I have. And I know that I've never been the same since I've had that encounter. I know that it was through Satan's angels of light. But I can show you in the scriptures also where it happened to God's people over and over again. How about Peter? Peter, Satan had desired to have thee to sift thee as wheat. Satan came to sift Peter directly. How about Paul, the messenger of Satan to buffet me? How about Jesus when he was in Matthew chapter 4 when he was there? What happened with Christ in Matthew chapter 4? Satan came directly to tempt him. How about David? And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. He came to him directly to provoke him. Right? How about Simon Peter? He had Simon the sorcerer. How about Paul? He had Elimaeus the sorcerer. You see... Satan may not audibly come to you, but if he cannot stop the preaching of the gospel, he will certainly come to infiltrate the work to destroy it and to pervert it by sending false converts, those with malicious intent to destroy. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly when that happened. Exactly when that happened. You know, when you see, <laughs> exactly, when you saw the rise of things like Hollywood satanic roots and those other things that took place, then you saw Satan come in from within and attack. Amen. That's right. You know, you may wonder, how is it possible that they can fool the people of God and the leaders of the church? Men who have the power of God, the Holy Ghost. Men who are born again by the Spirit of God. Well, Philip was filled with the Holy Ghost. Philip could do signs and wonders and miracles. And guess what? He baptized him. He baptized a sorcerer. Right? He did. He baptized a sorcerer. Amen. It happened. Right? And the, and the other 11... Didn't suspect Judas at all. Why? Because of the power of Satan. Mm -hmm. It's the power of Satan. That's what he does, and that's what this sorcerer did. He deceived them with his power. Think about this for a second. You have Peter, able to do miracles, had 3,000 men saved at a time, saw a wonderful movement of God, yet strayed and was withstood to his face by Paul. It's because we're all fallible men. Saints and God's generals in his military can be deceived by others. That's why the Apostle Paul said, brethren, pray for us. Because it is incumbent upon you that you pray for your pastor, that you pray the Lord's protection and guidance. For who is sufficient for these things? Right? If a man such as Philip could be deceived, then what chance of without God's hand and the prayers of the saints to such a man as I have? Think about it. I, I know the feeling of deceit. I know the sting of deceit. But they do this by the power of devils. I'll remind you of 2 Corinthians. Turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They, they were transformed for treachery. Remember that sermon? 
They had, they had nefarious reasons and motives to do what they do. They look so close to the real thing, as do the tares to the wheat. But they look a little too perfect. And that's the power of Satan. Never showing their failures, flaws, or secret sins they hold to and live in, all veiled in a deceptive heart of unbelief. I don't mean unbelief that dwells in even the saint's heart, but one that is led by the spirit of Antichrist. They come after the working of Satan, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, their pleasure was unrighteousness. Their pleasure was sin. Their pleasure was deceit. Their pleasure was evil. deceivableness of unrighteousness. That's what they pleasured in, the evil, the wicked. Right? So this man, Simon, these, they have a supernatural power of deception to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. I, I can tell you that it's, it's easy to be fooled by those false spirits sometimes. Amen. They look like they love God. They look like they're going to follow God. They look like they want to do something right. They look like it, don't they? Mm -hmm. You see, he made himself out to be a great one. Do you find it interesting that Kanye West, before his conversion, put those in parentheses, before his conversion, Kanye West called himself God in the flesh? He did. Yeah, he called himself Jesus. He said that he was greater than the Apostle Paul. He Does it sound like he made himself out to be a great one? Yeah, he said that just a couple weeks ago. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the quote exactly. See, Simon, the sorcerer, rose to prominence quickly among Christians. Astonishing, amazing, or confounding the judgment of the people. Right? To remove out of a out of a place or a state, to be transported. That's what that word means. To be transported out of the place, beyond oneself, to be bewitched. That's what it means. To be out of one's wits. A word that expresses precisely the same effect which the tricks of a ledgerman, of a juggler, produce the minds of the common people who behold his feats. He tricked them. He bewitched them. That's why Paul asked the Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Right? Simon Magus was probably a Jew or a Samaritan, says one, who had addicted himself to the arts of magic and who was once celebrated for it. He had studied philosophy in Alexandria and Egypt, says Moshim. And then lived in Samaria after he was cut off from the hope of adding to his other powers, the power of working miracles. The fathers say that he fell into many errors and became the founder of the sect of the Simonians. They accused him of affirming that he came down as the father in respect to the Samaritans, the son in respect to the Jews, and the Holy Spirit in respect to the Gentiles. Are you listening? He did not acknowledge Christ to be the Son of God, but a rival, and pretended himself to be Christ. He rejected the law of Moses. Many other things are affirmed of him which rest on doubtful authority. He seems to have become an enemy to Christianity, though he was willing then to avail himself of some of its doctrine in order to advance his own interests. That word magi, or magician, the name came afterward to signify those who made use of the knowledge of these arts for the purpose of imposing on mankind. Those are astrologers, soothsayers, necromancers, fortune tellers. Such persons pretended to predict future events by the positions of the stars and to cure diseases by incantations. Kind of like charismatics. You've always been gifted because you've been broken. You've always been gifted because you've been broken. You've always been gifted because you've been broken. Remember that? That's right. He, he called him out. 
That's what they do, though, don't they? They're incantations. It was expressly forbidden the Jews to consult such persons on pain of death. There were nine things that they were supposed to stay away from. Mm -hmm. In these arts, Simon had been eminently successful. Which before time in the same city used sorcery, who before Philip came hither practiced magic arts, wherefore he is commonly called Simon Magus, for he was a magician who had learned diabolical arts and used enchantments and divinations as Balaam and the magicians of Egypt did. And he bewitched the people, for he astonished them with the strange feats he performed, which were so unheard of and, and unaccountable that they were thrown into ecstasy and rapture. They were mesmerized by it. They were taken into ecstasy and rapture from it. This is the great power of God. Yeah, it does, but that's next week. And there was, and were, as it were, out of themselves, the through wonder and admiration at the amazing things that were done by him. Remember the Bible says, he's a type of the Antichrist. All the world wondered after the beast. They stood in amazement at the beast. Who was able to make war with the beast? Right? He gave out that he was some great one, a divine person or an extraordinary prophet. Maybe even the Messiah. Since the Samaritans expected the Messiah. And which the Syriac version seems to incline to, which renders the word thus, he said, I am the great one. The great person who Moses spake of as the seed of the woman under the name of Shiloh and the character of a prophet. I mean, he was making himself Christ. Why do you think John said, and there are many false Christs? Well, Matthew said false Christ shall rise. He said many antichrists. Many. Same thing. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> right? They were already in the world already. That's who he was talking about, these guys. Right? That such vile deceivers have the confidence to brag and the deluded multitude have the weakness to believe that they are very extraordinary persons that can do extraordinary things. Simon gave it out himself that he was some great one, and the people cry him up as the great power of God. The person called Simon, commonly known as Simon Magus or the magician, was not an uncommon figure in the history of this period. Such a one we meet with again in Elimaeus in the court of Roman the Roman governor, such a one was the famous impostor Apollonius, who flourished in the same century. An advanced knowledge of natural philosophy, especially of chemistry, gave these clever, unscrupulous characters a strange power and influence over men's minds. Kind of like doctors have today. Amen. A lot of doctors. An influence they constantly used to further their own selfish ends. Simon seems to have been really impressed with the miracles performed by Philip and at once perceived that these wonder works were a very different order from those which his superior knowledge of natural science enabled him to perform. He never seems to have comprehended the source whence proceeded Philip's awful power. See, he didn't know God. Simon didn't understand what magic this was. He thought he could attain it through buying it. Right? He attributed it simply to a deeper knowledge of the secrets of nature and thought the key to the art was, of course, to be bought. His mistake and discomfiture are related in the following verses. Bitterly annoyed at the result of his collision with the followers of Jesus, it is probable this unhappy man at once turned his great powers, for these undoubtedly he possessed in no mean degree, to oppose the growing influence of the little church. His evil work was crowned with no small measure of success. For in the records of the early history of Christianity, among the many false teachers who sprang up, Simon Magus is invested with a mysterious importance as the great Herazarek, the open enemy of the apostles. Inspired, it would seem, by the spirit of evil to countermine the work of the Savior and to found a school of error in opposition to the church of God. In the Treatise Against Heresies, a work now generally ascribed to Hippolytus, Bishop of Portus, near Rome, about A.D. 218 to 235, we find a general outline of the principles of Simon Magus and his school. Some account also is given in the same treatise of the Great Announcement. So there's a record of what his school was operating, how it was operating. A writing compiled from the oral teaching of Simon by one of the immediate followers in his, compi in his compilation of Revelation, with which he declared he was entrusted to set forth, and the work and person of Christ are disparaged and set aside. According to Justin Martyr, Simon pretended that he was God, above all principality and power. 
Jerome relates that he said, I am the son of God, the, the paraclete, the almighty. Such bold assertions as these related by Justin Martyr and Jerome were no doubt made subsequently to his collision with Peter and Philip. Exasperated by, his, exasperated by his repulse and the exposure he had suffered at the hands of these believers in Christ, envious too of their powers and also the consideration which they enjoyed with so many of the people he endeavored, he endeavored by assuming the titles of Master of Peter and Philip to win something of the power they possessed and which he coveted. He had a desire for their power, but not their God. The magical exercises of the wizards, who at the time very frequently wandered about in the East, extended chiefly to an ostentatious application of their attainments and physical knowledge, he talks about. They had different formulas and things they used. These men that come in by the power of Satan will take themselves, they will make themselves out to be someone great. They believe their intellect and their knowledge to be higher than other Christian men, that they are never wrong. By the way, I've heard him say that, that they're never wrong. And they can always discern matters better than others. And many times they are right in their discernment because it is not from God but from the devil. I've had people like that tell me they watched me for years before coming here. And I believe it. I've been around men who are calculated, who watch and maximize on the errors or failings of others. They are men that rise up quickly through the ranks without much scrutiny and are able to have the prominence in the church without putting in the actual time to be trusted. They are many times full of ambition, but they are not willing to humble themselves, submit to authority, and suffer for the cause of Christ. But they make themselves out to be some great one. There are, therefore, in reality, says one, magicians, and such a thing as magic. We'll turn to Exodus chapter 7. I think it's important that you understand that, that you're reminded of this, that this is no new thing, that it's gone on for years. Yeah. Right? It's gone on for years. Exodus chapter 7, the Bible talks about that magic, Exodus chapter 7, verse number 11, then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast on every man his rod and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Verse uh, 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. Magicians. Exodus 8, 7. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Do you believe that's real, or do you believe that's some kind of fantasy fairy tale in the Old Testament, or do you believe that's real? See, I believe it's real. I believe it's real because God said it, and I believe it. Amen? That's right. I, I, I believe it, that that's exactly what, what happened, and I believe that's exactly what happens in churches when people like that come along. And I believe it because the Bible illustrates it, that there's men like that out there. And they do it because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It really is a war. It really is spiritual warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. Right? They're not, they're not carnal weapons. You can't shoot devils. You're not going to have aliens come down that are going to be fallen angels. You're not going to take out an AK-47 and shoot them. Now, you can try, but it won't work. Of course, they probably won't have anything to do with you because you're saved anyway, but thank God. But... To others, that, that you're not going to be able to shoot them. You're not going to be able to stop them like that. Pastor Hoggard was talking about one of his videos that a man that was an ex-police officer, sheriff or something, he said one of, that he had an encounter like that where a ship or something came down and he tried to reach for his 45 and he couldn't. Like he, he couldn't even, he couldn't, he couldn't grab it. Why? Well, because they're demons. I mean, they're devils. That's what they are. Devils are real. 
I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you the truth. They're real. They're real. They, 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 there's a kingdom out there. And they hate you. And they hate this church. And they hate your pastor. And they'll do whatever they can to stop it. It's what they do. Right? So they made themselves out to be some great one. As if he had been God or at least had some great favor with him. And had received some extraordinary power from him. Ecclesiastical history speak much of him and tell us that he had a statue set up in Rome for him. Now, Kanye West says he's the greatest artist that God has ever created. He said this, and I quote, I know that God's been calling me for a long time, and the devil's been distracting me for a long time. He told Osteen in his megachurch congregation, going on to speak of his plans to bring the best, the best musicians back to church. I didn't know they were ever in church. We have writers, he said. We have producers. We're taking all the most fire producers and bring them back to God. You mean like Dr. Dre? Fiery homos. Right? I'm not kidding either. He is. All the best voices, all the best dancers, all the best, all, all the best. The look Luba just gave me, <laughs> what in the world? What? What's wrong with that guy? Anyway, I'm sorry. It's just the look you gave me was like, what? <laughs> oh, that's right. That's the same look I had. What is this guy talking about? What's the matter with this guy? Anyway, he's full of devils. That's what's the matter with him. <laughs> all the best voices, all the best dancers, all the best worship for us to see that it's through Christ. Following the Bible can free us all. End quote. He says this. He said, uh, Kanye West said this. Paul, the most powerful messenger of the first century. Now we stand here 20 centuries, centuries, centuries later, excuse me, because he was a traveler. Yeah. Kanye West in February 14, 2016, he was a learned man, not of the original sect. So he was able to take the message to the rest of the world. That's what Kanye said about Paul. He was saved from persecution due to his Roman citizenship. I have the right to speak my voice. So what he's saying there, this may be another hint about, about what his album title. How about The Life of Pablo? That was a dirty album, by the way. It was in 2016. It means Paul in Spanish. He had this set up. He was setting this up for a long time. Now, so notice the difference in motive between Simon and the apostles. Simon wanted to be viewed as some great one. The apostles wanted to be viewed as ordinary men. I want you to think about that. Remember, Simon wanted everybody to see him as a great one. The greatest artist ever. Right? Now turn to Acts 3.12. What did the apostles do, though? That wasn't what they did. Yeah. Absolutely. Because he's fooling real Christians. He's fooling real Christians. Right. There are real Christians that are being seduced by this and thinking that it's real. I can tell you they are because people like J.D. Hall, who may be not so much now, but was seduced by it. What surprised me has been like MacArthur were like, nah, that guy's a fake. He said it right. He said it almost right away. Right? Why? Because you only have to be through a few things to learn about people like that. But you've got to go through some things. You've got to get thumped on the head a few times, and then, then you figure it out. By God's grace. <laughs> and when Peter, Acts 3.12, and when Peter saw it, he answered to the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power of holiness or holiness we had made this man to walk? They didn't want any glory. It was like it wasn't us that did it. We didn't do it by our own power. So they weren't making themselves out to be some 
great one. Acts 10, 26. But Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. Well, there goes his popehood. He couldn't have been the pope. He lost that right away. Your fish head's gone, Pete. Acts 14. Break the statue, it's over. Acts 14, 14 and 15. Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven. So he's saying, hey, don't bow down to us. What did Simon want? He wanted self-glorification. The apostles desired men to glorify God. Now, God will humble his own servants when pride wells up in them. He is well able. Spurgeon said this about affliction in men. He said that some of us have to go to heaven being afflicted greatly because if we weren't, then we would be, so, we would be backslidden all the time. It would be very easy for us to backslide. So God gives us the rod of affliction constantly so we don't go astray and grow cold because it's so easy to. Better than apostasy. I would rather have affliction than apostasy. Amen. Paul would be shown how great things he would suffer for God's sake, for Christ's sake. Giving out that himself was some great one, this Simon. The cry of the people that he was the great power of God. Was, we, may we well believe, the echo of his own boast. He claimed to be in some undefined way an incarnation of divine power. This is There's so many sources that say this. The very name it appeared in our Lord's teachings when he spoke of himself as sitting on the right hand of the power of God. So he's mimicking it as an equivalent to the Father. Simon came up to a problem. He considered himself a great musician, or magician, but he had a problem. That's Kanye. He's a musician and the magician. When Philip came around, the real power of God came in. It didn't work. His witchcraft didn't work. It didn't have that effect. Now, to answer your question about the, uh, again, back to Kanye and his situation, here's the thing you have to understand. There's a lot of Christian kids that their parents are going to let them, I mean, in Christian, they're going to let them listen to that music because he says he's a Christian, so now it's okay. So those fence riders that were on the fence about those things, they're going to listen to that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that man has not been tested at all, period. Simon came up to this problem, though, when he saw that power of God, the real power of God. Simon being jealous that all his converts were being saved by the grace of God. So through Satan, he hatches this diabolical plan to regain and infiltrate. Epi Epiphanes saith that this knave called himself God, the father and the son, and his harlot, Helena, a horrible thing to be spoken, the Holy Ghost. If we believe Justin Martyr, almost all the Samaritans and not a few other nations adored him, acknowledged him to be, as it were, the supreme deity. He did it fast. The influence of Simon was fortified and entrenched by years of successful operation, as his acceptance of the gospel, related a moment later, was all the more phenomenal in the view of this. And with such a well-established base of influence, it would appear incredible on the face of it that he would have been given... He would have given it up without a struggle unless his motives had been good. Certainly, Elimaeus opposed the gospel, and it seemeth mandatory to believe that Simon would have done the same unless he had truly believed. Right? He had bewitched them. It happened in the year of, four, uh, of grace 434. This is another account that, that Trapp is talking about. He says a similar account happened later in church history. He said that a certain seducer who called himself Moses persuaded the Jews in Crete that he was sent from heaven with commission to repose, repossess them of the promised land. Him, therefore, they gladly followed. 
a great sort of them with their wives and children to the seaside, where he bade them to cast themselves after him from a steep rock into the sea. This they did, and there perished many of them, and many more had done, but that by a providence sundry were caught up by Christian fishermen there present at the time and carried safe to land. These, after they were recovered, carried notice to their fellows how fearfully they had been deluded by the devil who had impersonated Moses, and various of them, moved by their late calamity, became Christians. In the year 759, certain Persian magicians persuaded themselves and many others that if they sold all they had and cast themselves naked from the town wall, they should fly up to heaven immediately. <laughs> it's sad, but many perished by believing this senseless lie. You get to trap them a story like that. So this, this is the power of sorcery. This is the work that he had done. This is what his goal was. So you understand what type of figure that he was. So then we get into the doctrinal portions next week and some of the other things. Then you'll kind of get an idea and an understanding of why it impacted so much, why he's mentioned in here, why this is important. He's mentioned in the history here. Because they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God, and to him they had regard, because out of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But, verse 12 comes up, When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So it, it's, a lot of people were saved. He saw it. Next week we're going to get into the doctrinal implications of what was going on. And, why he wanted to follow that. And that's how sa Satan does that. We'll, we'll deal with that next week, though, and talk more about it then. It'll make, it'll make better sense to you now that you have kind of a little bit of a background there to go deeper in there, to kind of put it all together a little bit and understand the, the figure of Simon the Sorcerer. Are there still sorcerers? Yes. Are there still people that try to infiltrate churches like that? Yes. Do they still have a desire to destroy and hurt the work of God? Yes. Do they still want something that they see somebody else have, but they don't have it, and they wonder about it, and they want that? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. And that's part of their intrigue and their motivation to do it, is that purpose and that reason. Amen. So that begins at next week. We get to the revival part, but we're going to get to the doctrinal issues. There's some interesting things that take place there with him that talk about Simon and what he did in his supposed conversion and why it's not biblical, why it wasn't a real one, and why it showed. And why you'll see that, you know, you don't pronounce converts saved, right? We can't give people assurance, but we'll talk about that stuff next week. The Holy Ghost gives that. And you don't tell people they're saved because they make a profession. But anyway, we'll get into the doctrinal aspects of that and kind of talk about Simon and what he did, his infiltration, how it affected others, and um, the implications on the church and the carefulness and the watchfulness that the church had to have. Because remember, all this revival is going on, all this activity is going on, everybody's excited, people are getting saved, right? Uh, people are being moved by the Spirit of God, all this stuff is happening. We've been through, we've seen that, right? And then they slither in. Right? That's when it happens. That's when Satan does what he does. Amen? So, anyway, let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it, Lord. Thank you that we can know we have eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Lord, not by any other thing. And that, Lord, you saved the vilest of sinners, and you're merciful to us as you saved us, and those that have been born again by the Spirit of God. And, Lord, help us to live that life every day for you, from glory and honor to your name, in Jesus' name, amen.